Hello, boys and girls. I am back to pick right back up with chapter 11 in the book Shiloh. It's only after I lie back down on the couch that night that I realize what all I've done to Ma and Dad, for one thing. Ma's still awake. I can see the light in the bedroom as Dad goes down the hall, and then I hear their voices. Not all of what they say, but enough. Ray, you told, I told you I found out about that dog myself. Secrets for me, you and Marty, till morning, I would have told you then. Every day, the mail to Judd's place mentions that dog to me and all the time up on my own property, not even knowing. I bring my arms up against my ears and hold them there. So many things going wrong. It's hard to remember anything going right. Doc Murphy knows I've got Judd's dog now. Dad's mad at mom. And we won't know till tomorrow if Shiloh's even going to make it. Worst of all, I would brought Shiloh here to keep him from being hurt. And what that German Shepherd done to him was probably worse than anything Judd Travers would have brought himself to do, short of shooting him anyways. This time, when the tears come again, I don't even fight. Don't even try holding back. I must have slept through Dad's going off to work the next morning because when I wake, Becky's standing beside the couch eating a piece of honey toast and breathing on my face. Dara Lynn's already told her about the dog because she asks right off, Where is it at? The doggy. I sit up and tell her the dog's at Doc Murphy's and will find out how he is this afternoon. Then I look in the kitchen at Mom. There's a set look about the lips that means trouble. That means don't mess with her because she's already in trouble with Dad. So I go outside, pick me a couple of wormy peaches, and sit on the stoop eating at them, spinning out the wormy places. Darlene comes out and sits beside me. Today she's all kindness. Judd Travers don't take care of his dog, Marty. No wonder it come up here, she says, trying to say the right thing. I can tell she's been figuring it out from what she could overhear between Ma and Dad and anything else Ma told her. I take another bite of Peach. It wasn't like you stole him, she says. That dog came up here on his own. Just hush up, darling, I say, which I had no business saying. I didn't want to talk anymore. That's all. Well, you could have told me and I wouldn't have told anyone. Thanks. Ma says we've got to give him back to Judd Travers when he's better. I get up and start toward the hill to clean up the ground where Shiloh was attacked. See if there's any way I can put some fence wire over the top of the pen to keep out the shepherd. What's his name, Marty? Darlene calls after me. Shiloh, I tell her. I'm only halfway up the hill when I hear a car and turn around. It's Mrs. Howard's car and David's in it. Soon as he sees me, he jumps out. It's still moving a little and comes running towards me. I get to stay here today, he yells, waving a kite he's brought with him. Everyone else is going to Parksburg and I don't want to go. I look over to where Ma and Mrs. Howard are talking. See Ma nodding her head. I get lonely sometimes up here at our house, but today I want to be without that loneliness. Or today I actually want to be with that loneliness. Don't want to talk to Darlene, to Becky, to Dad, or even to Mom. If we had a telephone, I'd be calling Doc Murphy every hour. As it is, I have to wait till Dad comes home from work before I can find out about Shiloh. Can't go down to the pestering. I can't go down there pestering Doc with him seeing patients, too. What do you want to do? I asked David, trying to dig up the least bit of enthusiasm. David and I are in the same grade, even though he's taller and heavier and looks like a junior high already. Try out this kite over your meadow, he says. I lead him around the long way, away from Shiloh's pen, and he doesn't even notice because he's unwrapping his kite, made of silk or something, which is one of his relatives. They bought him that. 
We stand out in the meadow flying the kite and I watch the blue and yellow and green tail whipping around the breeze. And I'm thinking about Shiloh's tail, the way it wags. You get a dog on your mind. It seems to fill up the whole space. Everything you do reminds you of that dog. When we bring the kite down later though, David sees a groundhog and the next thing you know, he's after it. The groundhog zigzagging this way and that, David yelling like crazy. I'm taking your kite back down to the house, David, I yell when I see him getting near Shiloh's pen. He goes on running and yelling. I'm going to get me a handful of soda crackers. You want to make some peanut butter crackers? I call out trying to get him to follow. And then his yelping stops. Hey, he says, I know he's found the pen and I walk over. What's this? David asks. He looks at the blood on the ground. Hey, what happened here? I go over and yank his arm and make him sit down. He's looking at me, bug-eyed. You listen to me, David Howard, I say. Whenever I say David Howard, he knows it's serious. Only did it twice in my life. Once when he sat on the paper flower pot I made for Ma at school, and once when he saw me with my pants down in the bathroom. That really made me mad. But today I'm not mad, I'm serious. Something awful and terrible happened in there, David. And if you ever tell anyone, even your mom and dad, may Jesus make you blind. That's the kind of talk my folks can't stand. But I got it from Grandma Preston herself. Ma says Jesus don't go around making anyone blind. But Grandma Preston always used it as a warning. And she went to church Sunday morning and Sunday evening both. David's eyes about to pop out of his head. What? He asked again. You know, J Travers? He was murdered? No. But do you know the way he's mean to his dogs? He killed one of his dogs in there? No, let me tell it, David. You know how he's missing a dog. Yeah. Well, they come up here on its own and I let him stay. I built him a pen and kept him a secret and named him Shiloh. David stares at me. Then at the blood in the pen... Then back at me again. Last night, I tell him, Baker's German Shepherd jumped the fence and tore him up. We took Shiloh to Doc Murphy and Judd don't know. David's mouth falls open and hangs there. Wow, he says. Then he says it again. I tell David how hurt Shiloh was and how we've got to wait until tonight to see how he is. And then we go in his pen together. And David helps me clean up the blood, pull all the grass with blood stains on it, and throw it over the fence into the woods. It's easier somehow with David helping, with David knowing even. If it was me by myself, I'd be thinking again and again how this never would have happened if Shiloh could have got away from the shepherd. I look at David and think we're friends for life. Then I think of how there are exactly seven people now who know. I have Judd Traver's dog, and it's only a matter of time before somebody lets it out. Probably Becky. She'll warble to it to the first person coming up in the lane. Did you ever notice how the more a kid tries not to tell a secret, the sooner it gets out? Nothing that a child can do about that. A secret is just too big for a little kid. What I did expect was that the 33 before dad came home, here's Doc Murphy's car chugging up the lane and he's got Shiloh in the back seat. I'm standing out by the oak tree with David, taking turns on the back swing when I see the car and Shiloh's head raise up in the back seat. I'm over to that car in three seconds flat. Shiloh! No cry ever sounded so happy as the one that came up out of my throat. All of us, we are crowding around the car, Ma and Darlene and Becky and David Howard, and all of us are saying, Shiloh, here, boy, and holding out our hands, and Shiloh's trying to look everything in sight. Patient recovered faster than I thought he would, Doc says, getting his big belly out from behind the steering wheel and standing up. <laughs> so I figured I'd bring him over myself, and then to Mother, had patients coming in and out today, and don't know that I wanted them to see the dog. She nodded. I'm going to pay for this, Doc Murphy, I tell him. You send the bill to Dad and he'll pay it, but then I'm paying him. Well, son, that's a generous thing to do with a dog that's not even yours, he says. Is he all well now? No, 
not by a long shot. I think it's going to take a couple of weeks to heal, and I can't promise you he'll walk without a limp. But I got him sewn back up and full of antibodies. If you can keep him quiet for a few days and off that leg, I think he'll pull through just fine. If Ma was mad at me before, she's not now. Not the way Shiloh's licking all over both her arms, getting a quick lick in her face every time she bends close. Becky's sticking her hand out for Shiloh to lick, and when he does, she squeals and pulls back. Shiloh's tail going like crazy. It's like a welcome home party. Ma has me bring in this cardboard box from the shed, and we put an old pillow in the bottom of it and cover it with a clean sheet, and Doc Murphy lays Shiloh down inside it. Shiloh seems to know he can't walk too good because as soon as he tries to stand up, he sits back down again and licks his leg. I'm glad Shiloh's back. I'm glad he's going to get better and that we can keep him until he's well. But the more I sit there, petting his head, feeling his happiness, the more I know I can't give him up. I won't. <laughs>